I kind of embarked on this process of integration as we were in our first institute. And in that institute, they were talking about many analysts um, and they were saying things that I recognized had Jewish and Christian roots, but they never acknowledged that there were any Jewish and Christian roots. It's almost as if Christianity, Judaism, was totally dissociated out of any psychotherapy concepts. And so I took it upon myself to begin to explore. And where that ended up was the book Toward Mutual Recognition, uh, because actually there was a, uh, my mentor, Lewis Aaron, um, uh, said to me, look, you know, this hasn't been written about. Please write about it. And so it was a, a, a Jewish man, very well known in psychoanalysis, that actually wanted this and promoted this. So we praise God that he has his people everywhere. So let, let's get started then in the hidden Christian influences in psychoanalysis. In discussing this, we first have to talk about how psychoanalysis ended up being so devoid, and not only devoid of religion, but an antithetical to religion, opposed to it. And we've got to go to Freud to understand that and look at his history. I'm sure a lot of this you know already. Um, <clears throat> this is a quotation from uh, Freud. I may have been 10 or 12 years old when my father began to take me with him on his walks. On one such occasion, he told me a story to show me how much better things are now than they had been in his days. When I was a young man, he said, I went for a walk one, after, one Saturday in the streets of your birthplace. I was well dressed and had a new fur cap on my head. A Christian came up to me and with a single blow knocked off my cap into the mud and shouted, Jew, get off the pavement. And what did you do, I asked. I went into the roadway and picked up my cap was his quiet reply. This struck me as unheroic on the part of the big strong man who was holding the little boy by the hand. And this was the experience of Freud early on, that to be seen as religious was dangerous, and that the perpetrators in that v Viennese era were Christians. Okay. When Freud attended the University of Vienna, he was expected by his Gentile peers to feel inferior because he was Jewish. Throughout the university, anti-Semitism was encouraged even among the faculty. The one exception was the medical faculty, and that was where Freud found a haven in the midst of the scourge of church-sponsored anti-Semitism. The entire university really would not accept Jewish students, except for the medical faculty. And the reason for that was a lot of the medical professors came from Germany, and Germany was Lutheran. Okay. And so they did not have as much of a problem as the Habsburg slash political empire that was in, really with Luger in, in Vienna. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to switch to a little video clip that talks about a little more specifically about what it was like in Vienna in, um, in Freud's time. Hopefully this will work and we won't have any problem with it. So, here we go. The Jewish sect is a fact. You know, it's, it's interesting to me when, when we went to New York University uh, to do our postdoctoral work in psychoanalysis I, my husband and I came from a very conservative evangelical background, and I don't know if it's the same here, but evangelicals in the United States love Jewish people because they're God's chosen people. And it wasn't until Mel Gibson in The Passion, the movie The Passion came out, that all of New York City Jewish people rose up in rage at that movie. And I was like, what? I didn't understand it until I began to understand that anti-Semitism was the norm for centuries. Because in my Christian community, it wasn't that way. But Freud really had to endure this kind of persecution. And as a result, um, 
he had to hide his Jewish roots. Um, so let's, let's look a little bit more then about um, the impact of this persecution. Are there any questions, right? Did you understand that movie? And, and uh, yeah, okay, I imagine you're much better than a lot of us Americans. You speak probably six languages, each of you. <laughs> but we're, but, but we're, you know, we, we speak English barely, so. <laughs> <coughs> so what happened was that when the Enlightenment came, um, it supported laws of emancipation so that Jewish people could now enter the professions. A lot of people associated the Jewish population with, with bankers and people with money. The only reason for that is that's the only place they were allowed. They weren't allowed into the other professions. So they excelled at what they did. But when emancipation came, they were freed. Now emancipation, um, also brought change in the Jewish customs, the Haskalah. They, were, they started dressing differently, eating things that they hadn't eaten before, and it, they began to assimilate into culture. And Susanna Heschel, Abraham Heschel's daughter, said that the Jews not only assimilated, but they became divested of the recognition both of their ethnicity, their Jew, Jewish ethnicity, and also of their faith. Charles Taylor, the philosopher, depicts the post-enlightenment shift to secularism that influenced Jew and Christian alike. Because you see, the, the enlightenment and um, actually was based on humanistic ideas, which was secular. It really took what, what we understand some very Judeo-Christian principles and put them in secular humanistic terms. So he says, I've been drawing a portrait of a world we have lost, one in which spiritual forces impinged on porous agents, in which the social, the culture, was grounded in the sacred and secular time in higher times. And this human drama unfolded within a cosmos, God's cosmos. All this has been dismantled and replaced by something quite different in the transformation we often roughly call disenchantment. There was an era in which we believed there was a God in the universe and a God that was giving us uh, awareness of knowledge and truth and growth, and it all fit together. But when humanism said, the man is the measure of all things, we don't need God, then secularism came in. Now secularism became very important in terms of the Jewish population. A state-supported Christianity drove Jews toward secularism by its othering of Judaism. It then condemned Jews for being secular. Thus the enemy of my enemy, secularism, became a friend to many Jews. So in other words, that it was, it was religion that was persecuting of the Jews. So when the Enlightenment and secularism came in, they embraced it. Okay? Secularism produced a shift from belief in the goodness of the transcendent to an imminent humanistically based frame that empowered Jew and Gentile equally. Secularism protected Jews but evolved into a humanistic belief system that translated Jewish religious ideals into a non-religious creed, ultimately obscuring most original ties to Abrahamic faith. So what I'm trying to say is that often uh, Christians look at psychoanalysis, uh, I can speak for the United States, and say, oh, what a secular, atheistic religion, without realizing that Christians had a hand in pushing psychoanalysis toward a secular atheistic position. Because to be religious in Freud's day and time, psychoanalysis would never have flourished. Because he did not want it to be looked at as a Jewish uh, psychoanalysis. You, are you following me? Okay. So as I was writing my book, um, I was grieved in spirit 
that, that psychoanalysis and Jews had been blamed for being so atheistic and that we, as Christians, had a hand in encouraging that. So I wrote a letter to Freud. <laughs> it's my penance. <laughs> to Dr. Freud with deep regret. Dear Dr. Freud, it is with a degree of justifiable temerity, fear, that we write you. Our correspondence has been far too long delayed. Permit us to explain. Far too easy. Yes, it has been far too easy to denounce you for the repudiation of religion that your psychoanalysis at times has blatantly espoused. Religion is universal obsession. Religion is primitive relic. And in agreement with Feuerbach, religion is projection of the human psyche. For these profane pronouncements, we have facilely declared your guilt, neglecting to recognize our utterly despicable culpability. culpability. Forgive us for forgetting the long history that preceded your choice to hide the intrinsic Judaic character of your craft. It has been advantageous for us to ignore the centuries in which Christianity as empire decimated your Jewish brothers and sisters. We failed to acknowledge the history texts that attested to the pogroms, the prohibition, the ridicule that power structures bearing the convenient imprimatur of religion wielded against the children of Israel. We, in your terms, projected our own guilt onto you and failed to see the wounds that we caused, the shame which was ours to bear, the denial of God in ourselves which we located in you. We have handily dissociated ourselves from those impostors who bore the name of Christian and tormented you and your family. Thus we read your text through eyes of arrogance rather than through mists of tears. We want to revisit psychoanalysis, approaching it with the veil of atheism lifted with your Judaic subtext in high relief. We wish to contemplate that perhaps in the mystery of a Jewish and Christian providence, your works were yet another prophetic clarion call to truth, yet another redemptive outworking of God's irrevocable covenant with Jew and Gentile, with deep regret, a contrite Christian church. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about is if we will look at psychoanalysis, taking that veil of atheism off and believe that God called Freud to present these truths, albeit in secular terms, but to present these, these ways of understanding um, and that we can see in the text of psychoanalysis, Judaism and Christianity as well. And that's what we're going to be doing. Let's look at Freud's Jewish heritage and the Jewish character of psychoanalysis. There are two major beacons in psychoanalysis. Truth, we do interpretation, okay? And then also relationship. We work in the transference, it's the therapeutic alliance. So we have these two major things. Now, in Judaism, truth, the rabbis and the tradition of studying, interpreting, and reinterpreting the scriptures to find God's meaning that was hidden and transmitted through symbolic language. You know, you talk about the Midrash where you have the two rabbis and the one rabbi says, but this is what God is saying here and this is how I understand. Then the other rabbi says, no, but we must interpret it this way. This is what God is saying. And then they go to dreams, interpretation of dreams from scripture. This was in the Jewish Torah. And relationship, the study of the Torah was for the purpose of promoting and safeguarding relationship with God and with fellow humans. So those were two main things from Judaism. And we find that as very much a part of psychodynamic thought and of, of theory. So what was the purpose of, of uh, Israel in this world, according to the scriptures, to be a redemptive force to the nations. God wanted to use the people of Israel as they came out of Egypt to be a light of, of God's law. The reasons the Judaic character of psychoanalysis was cloaked 
anti-Semitism. So the way that I look at psychoanalysis from an eschatological perspective, eschatology is about, last time it's about what God is doing in the world, where he's taking us. It is a redemptive Jewish science. Jürgen Moltmann, the German theologian, observes the mission of Christianity is to be seen as the way in which Israel pervades the world of the Gentile nations with a messianic hope for the coming God. Christianity loses nothing by recognizing that its hope springs from this enduring Jewish root. Martin Buber, philosopher and Hasidic theologian, concurred that Christianity provided for the mysterious spread of the name, commandments, and kingdom of Judaism's God. Through the lens of eschatology and a shared hope of redemption, Rabbi Irving Greenberg can say, both Judaism and Christianity share the totality of their dreams and the flawed finiteness of their methods. From the perspective of a divine strategy of redemption, rather than from within the communities embedded in historical experience and needs, both religions have more in common than they've been able to admit to themselves. Both Jews and Christians have a revolutionary dream of total transformation. For what often seems an eternity, both have hoped and waited, and both have transmitted the message and worked for the final redemption. Both need each other's work and that of others to realize their deepest hopes. And I just want to make an aside here that part of the inspiration for both our institute and also for my writing the book was I was with a dear Christian friend, a professor, visiting Israel. And I was walking on the old wall, it has a you can walk on top of the wall. I don't know how many of you have been there. And I remember walking on there and looking at the gates and the golden gate that's closed and all. And I said to myself, dear God, you have used Israel in this world. And psychoanalysis comes from a Jewish person. Is there a way that I can beckon Christians to embrace what you have brought from psychoanalysis, not see it as something terrible? but something that you are a part of as well. And that's really where it was birthed on the wall as I was walking around Jerusalem. So, okay. Let's look at some other influences on Freud that helped him formulate what became psychoanalysis. Are you with me so far? Okay, if you have questions, just wave. Franz Brentano. Franz Brentano was a uh, professor at the University of Vienna, and he was in the uh, School of Philosophy. Now, the School of Philosophy um, was, again, it did not really want Jewish students, but um, Freud ended up taking five courses uh, with Brentano. Uh, between the years of 1874 and 1876, and he was in awe of Brentano. He was invited to Brentano's home to visit and dialogue. He writes of Brentano to his friend Panef, I, the godless man, medical man and empiricist, am attending two courses in philosophy. One of the courses, Listen and Marvel, deals with the existence of God, and Professor Brentano, who gives the lectures, is a splendid man, a scholar and philosopher. Brentano was a priest. Brentano loved God. And Brentano lived out his Christian life, inviting Freud and his friends into his home, much like Marek does, opening his home. Okay? He impacted Freud enormously. March 7th, Freud adds, the two of us, Paneth and I, have established closer contact with him. We sent him a letter containing some objections and he invited us to his home, refuted them, seemed to take some interest in us. When you and I meet, I shall tell you more about this remarkable man, a believer, a teleologist, and a Darwinian, and a damn clever fellow, a genius in fact, who is in many respects an ideal human being. For now, just the news that under Brentano's fruitful influence, I've arrived at the decision to take my PhD in philosophy and zoology. He was going to be able to shift into that. Um, 
Further negotiations about my admissions to the philosophical faculty, either next term or next year, are in progress. So he was having some difficulty getting into that department, but Brentano had impacted him so greatly that he literally was willing to try to get in there. So what was it that uh, Freud ended up taking from Brentano because he ultimately was not um, accepted into the philosophical faculty, decided not to go there, and uh, he ended up going into uh, more neurological studies. But what he got from Brentano, um, because Brentano believed in a u universe designed by God, he believed in teleology. He believed that we are motivated toward something. Closely connected to this belief is the key concept that he contributed to philosophy, which is intentionality. This construct suggests all mental phenomena are meaningful and are therefore intentional. He further asserted that all mental phenomena are object-oriented. They are to be understood relationally in relationship to one another. And, Brentano said, the most sublime object orientation, motivation, is the human response of love to a God who created us. That's what Brentano believed. But Brentano wasn't the only major force in Vienna. Auguste Comte, who was a logical positivist, was the spokesperson for this idea. Um, and his, this, his positivism was recognizing that only that which can be scientifically verified or that is capable of logical or mathematical proof um, is to be accepted. And it rejected any metaphysics and any belief in God. Auguste Comte believed in reason without God. He held that human thought had passed into a theological, through a theological stage into a metaphysical stage and was passing into a positive or scientific stage. Believing that the religious impulse would survive the decay of revealed religion, he projected a worship of mankind with churches, calendar, and hierarchy. He really looked at it as, there, there, you know, we'll, we'll have a religious desire, but it, it will all be based on science, and it'll be the religion of science. But Brentano believed differently. He believed in reason with God. He was an empiricist like Comte and applauded the positivism of his day. But he retained a place for a telos, thus asserting that science and religion can beneficially coexist. Freud ended up going with Comte, and he studied with Ernest Brucke who was the foremost representative of positivism in Vienna. Freud made the decision to go uh, in that direction. He went to his lab where the puzzles of the nervous system, first of fishes, then of humans, meet, meeting his exacting teacher's demands and expectations. So he began to really get into biology and neurology, and he left all that philo philosophical stuff aside. So let's look at the trajectory of Comte and the trajectory of Brentano. Comte's legacy of logical positivism led to Brucke, which in fact impacted Freud, which led to Freud's ideas of drives, instincts, discharge, constancy, and to his idea of the project for a scientific psychology. The net result is that humans are scientific organisms. Totally objective, totally modernistic. Brentano was involved with the birth of phenomenology. He's actually considered the fountainhead of phenomenology. Phenomenology argues for an approach to psychology that gives priority to experience as it's lived and reported by the subject. Psychoanalysis from this approach resumes its posture as a talking cure, emphasizing the patient's descriptions of experience as well as his effort 
or her effort to understand. Now, you need to understand something here that part of my presentation was given in, at NYU in which there's a very large relational psychoanalysis department. And I was wanting to give them an understanding that part of relational psychoanalysis comes from a Jewish and Christian root. And that where Freud took it was he dropped that root and he went the scientific route. So I'm br I brought it back and that's why I'm talking about phenomenology versus Freud's more scientific approach. Now let's look at where Brentano's legacy. Brentano impacted Husserl, who was his protege. And of course Husserl impacted Heidegger. Heidegger um, had a student who was Hans Lowald. Hans Lowald had Stephen Mitchell, who was the originator of relational psychoanalysis. He studied under Hans Yo Lowald at Yale. And the net result of that was Stephen Mitchell saying, humans are first and foremost relational beings. So humans as scientific organisms, humans as relational beings. Now we understand it's not mutually exclusive, right? It's not like it's either this or either that, because some people can kind of go into radical opposites. But we are created in the image of God as relational beings, created to relate. And to me, that fits with my theology as well. So these two strands have existed. And fortunately, after many years of being stuck in the scientific, relational psychoanalysis brought back relationality as absolutely essential and really was a resurrection of Jewish and Christian ideas back into psychoanalysis. Because if you're thinking of Judaism as truth and relationship, what he took was just the truth, interpretation, truth. And he left out the relationship. And relational psychoanalysis brings that out in. Now, what we're going to do is talk about the various theorists that contributed um, or, or reintroduced Jewish and Christian ideas into psychoanalysis. Now, the first person um, is Shandor Ferenczi. Now, Shandor Ferenczi um, is not a, was not a Christian. Shandor Ferenczi was not somebody who most people would consider to have anything to do with Christianity. But when I started studying him, he's Hungarian, um, I said, man alive, there's something about Shandor Ferenczi that feels so Christian. Because while Freud talked about insight, Ferenczi talked about emotional understanding. Freud avoided countertransference, the relational part. Ferenczi said, oh no, what goes on between us is important to understand. Freud talked about analytic authority. Ferenczi talked about mutuality. Freud talked about treatment. Ferenczi talked about healing. Freud looked at sexual abuse as just up in the mind, the head of the person, it's fantasy. Ferenczi said, oh no, some of this really happened. Okay, so there was a belief. So there was something so human about Shandor Ferenczi. Now Ferenczi and Freud was in Freud's inner circle, one of the closest people to him. At a certain point in 1949, Shandor Ferenczi wrote a paper um, that was called The Confusion of Tongues. And it was about how little children are reporting that they actually had sexual abuse. And this was presented at a Congress. And from that point on, Freud got rid of him. All of Shandor Ferenczi's works were forbidden to be read. Um, uh, Ernest Jones actually said it's taboo. And Shandor Ferenczi's works were hidden until late 1980s, 1990s. And Lewis Aaron, the relational psychoanalyst, and Adrian Harris found them and brought them um, really uh, to be understood and known. So how did Shandor Ferenczi become so um, 
human and had these kind of Jewish and Christian ideals? Well, I did some study. <laughs> Nobody wanted to look at this. Ferenczi came from Mishkolk, which was the part of Hungary that was Calvinist. Okay. He attended a Calvinist gymnasium. He was, and I looked up his report card. He was, he studied things, he understood um, Protestant faith. Not only that, his father had a bookshop. And if, if you understand, there was this battle between the Protestants in Hungary and the Habsburg Empire. And so the Protestants who were against the Habsburg Empire became allies with the Jews because the Jews were under persecution by the Habsburg Empire. His father printed and published Protestant literature from pastors. And so Ferenczi was surrounded by Protestant and, um, and Christian material. Not only that, when Ferenczi left Mishkolk and went to Budapest, he uh, lived above uh, a cafe. And in, in Budapest, all the literati would go to the cafes and would talk about literature that was and philosophy and all that. And a very big person in Budapest was a, a man named Lukash, L-U-K-A-C-S, a philosopher. And Lukash loved Kierkegaard. And he had the whole group, study group, study Kierkegaard's works of love for a year. And Shandor Ferenczi was part of that group that studied works of love. So when Ferenczi starts talking about um, hypocrisy among analysts who think that they know everything, when he talks about love as being the most important thing, when he talks about um, standing against uh, facades and believing in people, where do you think he got that from? Okay. If you read Kierkegaard, that's what Kierkegaard was about. Okay. But nobody in psychoanalysis made the connection that Kierkegaard, the Christian philosopher, had influenced Ferenczi. Now Ferenczi became extremely important in the foundation of relational psychoanalysis. Even though his works were hidden, people followed him still. And we're going to see now the trail um, that he actually left. I hope we're going to see it. OK. <laughs> um, Ian and Jane Suddy. Ian Suddy was a Scotsman and uh, a very, very committed Christian. He, um, he wrote the book Origins of Love and Hate um, way back in the 30s, I believe, 1930s, before much of anything of object relations had started. In fact, he is looked at as one of the first people that wrote in object relations. And he was saying that it's relationship that's important and love that's important. And in his book, He's talking about the Christian ideals of community that is what's going to bring healing. Ian and Jane Suddy were friends of Shandor Ferenczi. Jane Suddy translated Ferenczi's works from Hungarian into English. So the connection between this Christian theorist and Shandor Ferenczi was unknown, but they thought the same, the same way. Unfortunately, Ian Suddy, the week that his book was published, he developed appendicitis and suddenly died. And so we don't know any more um, about him, but his works influenced the object relations movement. Okay. Oscar Feaster. Oscar Feaster was a Swiss, um, pastor, and he was one of the closest friends of Freud. Anna Freud said that he would come to their home and he would love to play with the children. And he was a pastor, but he was one of the warmest people. And he's one of the few 
that Freud didn't cut out of his life. He was a friend to the end of Freud's life. Um, and he was an apostle of psychoanalysis. And he would always be arguing with Freud about the importance of faith. How many of you are familiar with the name Oscar Feaster? Okay. You should read about Oscar Feaster. He really was um, uh, an amazing Christian. And has, uh, there's all of the letters between Freud and Feaster have been published into, into a book. And he was such an apostle of psychoanalysis that one of the first important books on psychoanalysis uh, was written. And lo and behold, one day, this man, Winnicott, was walking in a bookstore in London. And he was very interested in going into psychology, understanding psychology. And so he talked to the clerk, the lady there, and said, you know, are there any books in psychology that would be good for me to read? Oscar Feaster's book was there. She said, oh, this is a very good book. You may want to read this. So D.W. Winnicott was introduced to psychoanalysis through a book by the Christian Oscar Feaster. Now, if you know anything about Winnicott, are, you're familiar with the fact that D.W. Winnicott was raised a Christian. OK. Winnicott grew up in a very Christian family. He, um, his father was a, uh, an elder in the Wesleyan Church. He attended services all the time. Um, they said that to his dying day, he was singing hymns. Now, Winnicott did not retain a vital act of faith in God, but his religion permeated, for better or for worse, his, his work. Um, he emphasized the true self. He emphasized the love of a mother and infant as being so important for the development of a child. Um, he also was the one that talked about uh, the uh, potential space. And in that space, we, we have ideas of religion. So he actually made religion something OK to talk about in psychoanalysis. Now, the, the difficulty with, with Winnicott is that in that he grew up in a Methodist Wesleyan home, they always emphasized holiness and getting over your sin and being perfect before God. And by the time Winnicott had, had grown up, he was up to here with the idea of sin. Now, at the same time in psychoanalysis, you had Melanie Klein. Now, Melanie Klein, if you know anything about her, talked about innate aggression. A child is born with aggression. And what Winnicott said is the idea of innate aggression is too close to inborn sin. And I can't stand the idea that we're born with sin. So Winnicott kind of did away with the idea of a child born with a sinful nature and only looked at a child as having good potential and if the child is not treated right, problems happen. And he had a huge disagreement with Klein about this. Now, interestingly enough, Melanie Klein had analysis with Shandor Ferenczi, who, by the way, just as an aside, was understood as the, the analyst of last resort. When somebody couldn't be helped, they were sent to Budapest to work with Shandor Ferenczi because Shandor Ferenczi believed in people and loved his patients. Okay. So, so as, as you can see, D.W. Winnicott's Christianity influenced what he wrote, but also influenced the way he wrote his theory, because he couldn't stand the idea of sin. So his theory really pushes against the idea of inborn sin. Hugh Crichton Miller. Are any of you familiar with the name Tavistock, Tavistock Clinic, the group therapy in London? OK. Tavistock Clinic was originally founded by Hugh Crichton Miller. Hugh Crichton Miller was an absolutely committed Christian. And he brought many Christians to the Tavistock Clinic. Now, today, you would never know that Tavistock Clinic had anything to do with Christians. It was so Christian in the time of, of uh, Freud and Ernest Jones, 
that it was called the Parsons Clinic. Parson is another name for preacher, the preacher's clinic. Um, and it, he wrote a book on pastoral counseling. But not only that, because it was so affiliated with religion, Ernest Jones took it away. He said, nope, can't go to Tavistock either. So Shondor Ferenczi, Tavistock, they're bad because they have religious influences. Okay? Nonetheless, it was a very important place in the history of psychoanalysis. John Rickman was also at Tavistock. And John Rickman was a Quaker. He wrote a paper on the need to believe. And he was an analyst to a number of people who were Christians because he was totally fine with the belief in God. And he was at Tavistock Clinic. Wilfred Bion. Wilfred Bion was born into a Huguenot family, a family of believers. He was born in India. And um, they had Bible verses all over his home. Now, Bion moved away from his Christian faith and took mystical ideas. But you can still see in Bion um, this emphasis on spirituality is something that is good, that is OK. And he kind of wove it into there. Um, now, as you can see, the people that I'm talking about are part of the object relations tradition in, in Great Britain. And what, what I'm going to do in a little bit is talk in a little more depth about object relations, because really, object relations captured the idea that it's about relationship, which is bringing us back to Jewish and Christian faith. Michael Ballant was uh, a Hungarian, and he converted to Christianity. Now, a lot of people say he converted to Christianity only because he wanted to avoid um, persecution, anti-Semitic persecution. But we became friends with uh, the person, I don't know if he was his, Ballant was his supervisor or his analyst, but Andre Hanal in Geneva, uh, we sat with him and he had all his letters and arc in an archive. And we asked him point blank, did Michael Ballant convert to Christianity just to avoid anti-Semitism or because he wanted to be a Christian? And he said, no, he really was a Christian. He became a Christian because he wanted to. W.R.D. Fairbairn. Now, in a few moments, I am going to actually talk very deeply about Fairbairn's life and his theory, because Fairbairn is one of the most important theorists that um, relational psychoanalysis really grabbed from. Stephen Mitchell loved Fairbairn. And we're going to see how Fairbairn becomes the bridge between Christianity and psychoanalysis, uh, relational psychoanalysis. Um, Harold Guntrip was a, an analysand, um, both had Fairbairn as his analyst, but also was mentored by Fairbairn, um, and Winnicott for that matter, and he popularized Fairbairn's ideas. Um, Fairbairn's ideas were a little dense if you read him, but, but Guntrip, who was a congregational minister, um, made them understandable. So here we have all the European people. Now we're going to switch to the American people that were influenced by Christianity. James Jackson Putnam. Um, James Jackson Putnam was the first president of the American Psychoanalytic Association. He was a committed Christian, and he first heard Freud at Clark University. When Freud went with Jung and with um, Ferenczi, they went and spoke at uh, Clark University. And so after the meeting, he was so struck by Freud that he invited him to his cabin in the mountains. And they sat and talked and talked. Now what people haven't known is that Putnam had been involved with a spiritual movement before psychoanalysis called the Emmanuel Movement in Boston that had counseling in churches to try to help people in churches to, to have healing. And, um, but when uh, psychoanalysis came and he saw the depth and the richness, 
he embraced it fully, but would always be arguing with Freud about accepting religion, accepting a god. So, but you would be surprised. At the anniversary of, of Putnam's, uh, I guess, birthday or something, um, stuff was being written about what a wonderful atheist he was, totally, totally erasing the fact that he was a Christian, you know? So, and that's that, that hidden, you know, sentiment against uh, religion. Clara Thompson. Now, I'm sure some of these names you've, you've heard. Clara Thompson was really big in the interpersonal movement in the United States. Now, interpersonal psychiatry, as you're familiar with Sullivan and Thompson and some of these people, they basically were talking about psychoanalysis is not just about the individual, it's about the culture, it's about being related to other people. Clara Thompson was big with the White Institute in New York City. People did not know Clara Thompson was born into a Baptist family and studied to be a medical missionary. Okay. Now, she pulled away from her Christian faith because she also was the subject of abuse, sexual abuse, by a Christian when she was young, and she kind of left it. But she kept some of the, the ideas about the human relationship. She um, worked in a hospital, and she called a group that she ran the Miracle Club, because these were people that were miracles in terms of, of their healing. And she also had analysis was Shandor Ferenczi. She traveled there because of all the problems that she had. Ferenczi impacted her. Harold Stack Sullivan, who was really the originator of the interpersonal movement, um, was raised Catholic, but he grew up in a Protestant community and was persecuted for being Catholic. But his Catholic faith uh, caused him to, number one, think of participant observer. In other words, we have the saints that are observing us and participating in our lives. They're connected with us. They're not just um, you know, there, but they're involved. They pray for us because that was in the Catholic Church. And so in his theory, he talks about participant observer, that the analyst is not just a separate person, but is also involved in the dynamics. Okay? And some people say that that was in part taken from his belief in, in the Catholic Church. But the most important thing to me that he did, if you know anything about Harry Stack Sullivan, is he got rid of Pope Freud. Okay? He took all of Pope Freud's language, threw it out the window, all of the mystical inside metaphysical stuff, and he kept it very phenomenological, very much talking about the person's experience. So that, in, in essence, he, he really dealt with his upsetness at all the mysticism and uh, got rid of Pope Freud. So. Then we have Heinz Kohut. Heinz Kohut, um, the originator of self-psychology, um, he converted to Christianity as well. And if you read anything about self-psychology, you find a lot of Christians go into that because there's so much about it that has a, a, a Christian sensibility. Um, and there are, are many people who say that, uh, were very upset that Kohut was being viewed as having converted to Christianity. In fact, they were enraged with um, Kohut's son that said, yeah, he, he really did. As a matter of fact, at Heinz Kohut's funeral, they, the hymn that was played was A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so, so little did people know that all of these great names in psychoanalysis were impacted by Judaism and by Christianity. Eric Erickson. Um, Eric's, Erickson was uh, married an Episcopalian, and he was a very close friend of Paul Tillich and Reinhold Neighbor. 
Many of his writings, the Galilean sayings of I, um, the man Martin Luther, he wrote a lot about Christian figures and a lot of what he writes also is, has a, an essence of, of, of Christianity. So, and then finally, Karen Hornai. Karen Hornai um, was raised Lutheran. She had, you, you can read her diaries, which I read because I met with her, her daughter, who, uh, Marianne Eckhart, who um, talked about her mother's Christianity. And her diary talks about her Christian faith and wanting to, to please Jesus. Um, uh, Hornai trained to be a doctor and ended up going to study uh, and do a residency with Karl Bonhoeffer in Germany. Now, Karl Bonhoeffer was very interesting because he was one of the only uh, doctors who would take Jewish residents. And this was in Germany, and we're moving into the era of, of Hitler in World War II. Um, and it just so happens that Karl Bonhoeffer, who do you think Karl Bonhoeffer's son was? Guess. Have you ever heard of the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Who, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who gave his life to try to stop Hitler, okay, and was killed. So Hornai studied with his father, who was a committed Christian. And interestingly, with Karen Hornai moving away from her Christian faith, she, she really uh, did a lot of writing against dogma, that we can't be dogmatic. We need to be open to other people and other ideas because she was raised in a Lutheran home that was very dogmatic. So some of the people that were influenced by Christianity embraced it and wrote about it in their work. Others pushed it away, and it was what they pushed away that became part of their theory. My husband and I had the privilege of really studying W.R.D. Fairbairn very um, carefully. We went to Scotland to um, the archives at the uh, Edinburgh uh, Library uh, where all of Fairbairn's personal effects are. and. Um, we just had a lovely time doing that. We met his son, Cosmo, um, and we didn't realize it when we were there studying in Edinburgh, we stayed at the hotel that he always took his friends to for meals. So in any case, Fairbairn um, is, is, was a committed Christian and was a Christian to the end of his life, though one of his biographers said he kept it secret. Because in psychoanalysis, if you're a Christian, it was a no-no. Okay? So let's look at the religious influences. Why Fairbairn's Christianity, um, how it developed that way, and why he became a psychoanalyst in spite of that. So we have British cultural influences, influences from his family, his educational and professional and personal. Now, Great Britain is a very interesting study in Christianity. Um, as early as 200, uh, Tertullian and Origen talk about the British Isles. In Scotland, we talk about St. Albans and St. Patrick. We talk about Columba of Iona and Celtic Christianity. So Great Britain has been um, very influenced by Christianity from, from the beginning. Now, another influence is you have the Continental Enlightenment, which we think of France as, as like the seat of the, the Enlightenment. And then we have the British Enlightenment, and they're very different. What was different is that the Continental Enlightenment rejected religion. Religion, Voltaire said, must be destroyed among respectable people and left to the canaille large and small, for whom it was made, the animals. Okay? The Enlightenment in the British Isles remained connected with religion and was called moral philosophy, so that the academy, teaching, and religion were interwoven. Okay? Um, a huge difference. So they never jettisoned, they never said, you can't be thinking about religion if you're an academic 
And so it developed together in the Enlightenment. So influences from his parents. He was born in, in Edinburgh. His uh, father was Presbyterian. They came from Presbyterian ancestors. Some of them were theologians. Um, and uh, they were, his family was very involved in a major split in the Scottish Reformed Church because the Scottish Reformed Church had gotten liberal and had, had started to move away from the faith and had a lot of, I'm talk about this in a little bit, but it became, if you pay enough, you get to be a minister. And so the Scottish Free Church split away and Fairbairn's family was part of that split. They wanted real Christianity. Cecilia's father um, was a Methodist minister. Cecilia was uh, the mother of Fairbairn. And he went to church with his parents every Sunday and he would write about the messages. Here's a picture of Fairbairn as a little boy with his dog. <laughs> Influence from the church, um, as I said, there was a split and um, they didn't want it to just be about money. They wanted it to be about people who were truly spiritual being in the clergy. And here's this a famous painting of what they call the disruption. The atmosphere of this free church, the part that split off, was conservative evangelicalism. And people associated with this came to revivals. There were revivals that swept through England, Wales in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Um, and they were related to the earlier uh, Second Great Awakening in the United States when evangelicalism was really in the ascendancy. Now I know that Billy Graham um, ministered in, in Europe, but prior to Billy Graham there was Billy Sunday and there was Moody. And that church that Fairbairn's family was a part of was influenced by Moody and Sunday, Gypsy Smith, all of those. Um, I don't know if any of these names mean anything to you. Bonar, um, Robert Murray McShane, they were missionaries. They traveled through Eastern Europe as they went to Israel because the early British church really was for the formation of Israel as a state, Palestine. Um, they supported the free church and uh, they drew capacity meetings. So, Then educational influences. Fairbairn went to Merkiston Castle School. And here's a picture of him in that school. The Distinctives. It was founded in 1833 by Charles Chalmers, who was one of the people that helped with the split from the old uh, Reformed Church. Thomas Chalmers, brother of Charles, was a scientist and a theologian. Notice he was both. You could believe in science and you can believe in theology. Okay. And he was, the, the, so the leader of his school was one of the leaders also in that disruption that took the church to real, spiritual, vibrant Christianity. Um, and this respect for both science and faith was the symbol of this school. They believed in both. And that's, this is where Fairbairn studied. Fairbairn also went to theology school, divinity school. He wanted to study law, but his philosophy courses um, really made him interested in spirituality. And Fairbairn decided to become a minister. And he studied in Strasbourg and Kiel and Man Manchester. Um, you know, it was interesting when we were learning about Fairbairn from our Jewish mentor, he said, oh, and he studied Hellenistic Greek. And I, I, I stopped and thought to myself, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He studied theology. He studied New Testament Greek. That's where he learned Greek, not Hellenistic Greek. They totally didn't realize that that's why he was studying Greek, to read the Bible in the ancient languages. And he studied the German because he also wanted to understand higher criticism, German theology. Okay. 
And so he took an intermediate degree in divinity to be a, a clergyman. Now, while he was studying philosophy, he came under the influence of Andrew Seth Pringle Pattison. Now, Ang Andrew Seth uh, Pringle Pattison gave the Gifford Lectures, and the title during the time that Fairbairn knew him was The Idea of God in the Light of Recent Philosophy. And he says, no deeper foundation of idealism can be laid than this perception of the spirit's power to transform the very meaning of the past and to transmute every loss into a gain. Okay? This is the omnipotence of atoning love, unweariedly creating good out of evil. It is no far off theological mystery, but God be thanked the very texture of our human experience. So Fairbairn was influenced by this man that basically talked about brokenness being converted into something redemptive. Okay? You see the basis here for his theory. But Fairbairn, um, when he went off to college and later even, kept his faith. He had meetings where they would have, they would preach messages to one another, they would sing hymns, and they did this quietly and privately. And when my husband and I were studying at the archives, we looked at his diaries, and all this was written, I'm meeting with this, and this is what I'm speaking on. Um, so his faith was so, we're not, we're not talking about just somebody that had cultural Christianity. He was passionate about his faith. Um, now, he came under the influence when he had his own analysis of a man named Ernest Connell. He had his analysis with this man. Nobody knew anything about this man, but of course my husband and I did some research. And um, Ernest Connell was, an, was described as a very full-blooded Christian. Okay. He came from Australia and married his wife in the Catholic Apostolic church, which was very Pentecostal, very charismatic. He moved to Edinburgh because he became a psychoanalyst. But Fairbairn um, really chose him because he knew he was a committed Christian. So even his analysis was with somebody that was a committed Christian. And again, none of this was spoken about because religion was something you don't talk about. In uh, Fairbairn's library, which we looked at all the copies of books he had, Ian Suddy's book was there, underlined. He studied Ian Suddy. And it was also written that he had them as dinner guests at, at his home. He was also influenced by John McMurray. Now, as you remember the name Guntrip, um, Guntrip studied with John McMurray, who was a Christian philosopher. And um, McMurray was also a, a friend of um, Buber, and McMurray and Buber and several others, Pringle Patterson, would meet on a regular basis at Oxford University to talk about the, uh, the need to bring science and theology together. McMurray says a belief in God is necessary because the character of the world's unity can only be personal. We live in a personal, relational universe. Now, religious uh, evidences. How do we know, uh, what, what do we see in, in Fairbairn's writings that really tell us, in fact, that his faith carried in. And in religious uh, observance, we uh, studied his diaries and we made a list of all the church services that he mentioned that he had attended. 1918, 1919, and then we went to the end of his life in 1963. He would attend services morning and night and in the middle of the week. So his faith continued unabated. Okay. Now I must say that when we showed this to our Jewish colleagues, they weren't real thrilled to see this. So <laughs> um, and then we see his Christian faith and his personal writings. Okay. 
Um, he was at a missionary conference in Edinburgh when he was 21 years of age and was very impacted by it. So he has a diary entry in 1910. August 11th, which is notable as the 21st birthday of that humble servant of King George, Ronald Fairbairn, not only a humble servant of King George, I hope, however, but also of Jesus Christ. For at a time such as this, it is well to be serious for a moment and to pause at this great turning point of life, to take a breath of heavenly air before plunging into the work and stress of manhood. It is hard to combine in the right mixture the jollity and the seriousness, which are both essential for a, pres a presentable life. The ideal man, in my opinion, is one who, while realizing the seriousness and responsibility of life, yet sees life's whimsicalities and joys as well. But how few of such there are. The serious side must never be neglected. For, for what I call full-bloodedness must be remembered too. It is neglect of this, for one thing, that alienates modern youth from the church. Is the religion of the average church of today of a nature to capture and mold the full-blown life of the healthy-minded young man and woman? Or does it only provide for one type of mind? Is it only suited for half of the individual's life? True Christianity ought to satisfy every legitimate instinct and aspiration. It ought to be a working and workable philosophy of life for man and boy, matron and maid. It ought to be adaptable to the condition of schoolroom and football field, of office and golf course, of factory and home. God, give me strength to do my share, however little, to effect that unspeakably desirable consummation. I have decided to devote my life to the cause of religion, but may it be a manly, healthy, wholehearted, strong religion appealing to enthusiasm of youth as well as to the quiescence of old age. In other words, may it be a Christ-like religion. Okay? So he came from this, you know, gung-ho Christian, you know, read the Bible, have your devotions, Christianity, where there was no joy, and, and he basically said, I want to, to devote my life to a real full religion. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Now, young people don't want Christian faith because it's boring. And there's nothing about it that's filled with joy. So, so that was at the beginning of his, his life. But now I want to skip to the end of his life and show that his faith was still there. This was his dinner speech at his 70th birthday party. Okay. He quotes the psalmist. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So I confess I entertain a certain ambivalence toward my 70th birthday. But at his 70th birthday, he's quoting scripture. So we know his whole life. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to literally fly through his writings, and you will see in bold, in his writings, chronological order, um, mentions of Christianity or of, of faith. 1929, notice in bold, religion, the Christian era. Principles of psychoanalysis, he's quoting St. Paul, I had not known sin but by the law. 1930, he talks about Unselfish devotion to the welfare of others, which is the keynote of Christian morality. 1930, um, we're talking about the guilt, oppression. We're talking about eros and its god, Thanatos as its devil. So he's using language of, of, of religion. In 1934, he talks about pilgrim's progress, the joys of salvation. 1934 again. He's talking about the Garden of Eden. 1937, he's talking about the Puritans that he didn't like. They were too boring and dour. <laughs> In 1938, the persistence of beauty in nature has been cited in support of the teleological argument for the existence of God. Okay. 1939, 
He's talking about St. Paul. We ourselves were sometimes foolish, you know. Um, psychoanalysis is only performing within the scientific field a task which has been performed repeatedly outside that field by moral and religious reformers throughout the ages. He's basically saying to psychoanalysts, hey, look, the pastors were doing this long before you. Maybe they didn't have all the knowledge, but this healing of the soul, that territory has been the territory of religion even before this. There is no gap. I was driven to remark, what these people really need is not a psychotherapist, but an evangelist. Okay. Um, and he's, in his theory, he's talking about um, how, in, in, he quotes from Milton in Paradise Lost about religion. Um, he's talking here about um, the Christian conception of the devil and, and sin. Religion has played a much greater influence in the development of culture. Garden of Eden, he's talking about that again. He's 68 years of age here. It corresponds to the emotional need which in my opinion provides the main dynamic of the desperate if dumb appeal of many patients for psychotherapeutic help the need for salvation, the need for forgiveness of sins, the religious need for casting out devils. Okay. It is true that Freud has spoken of the lie of salvation, but it is significant that in spite of this, he devoted his life to devising a method of psychotherapeutic treatment which is very like a means of salvation. What the patient is really seeking is salvation from his internal bad objects, from his hate and from his guilt. Religion and psychotherapy are very closely related. Religion is the earliest and original form of psychotherapy. From a religious or any rate Christian point of view, what man seeks salva from salvation from sin, estrangement from God, spiritual death, and that fear which is cast out by perfect love. Age 70, he wrote a paper in, uh, or a review of um, Rickman's paper on the need for belief. So as you see, from 21 years of age to 70, it fills his life. Now we're going to go to his theory. How did it affect his theory? And the reason this is important is Fairbairn's theory is an aspect of relational psychoanalysis, though no acknowledgement of the Christian part of it exists. But let's see how it affected his theory. Now what I want you to think about when we look at his theory is creation, fall, redemption. That's the Christian cycle, creation, fall, redemption, and how it connects to his theory. Now this is gonna be a little thick. I am not showing you this to teach you Fairbairn's theory because it's dense, but if you can at least become curious and interested, okay. Creation and Fairbairn's theory of motivation. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the religious piece and then Fairbairn's theory. Christian and Judaic narratives start with humans created to desire a relationship with a creator who loves and desires them. Calvin knew that human desire at its best was but a mirror of God's own desire for relationship. Calvin declared that God persists in desiring relationship with us by inviting and ex exhorting us to imitations of himself. God desires relationship. Fairbairn postulated that the infant is born innately motivated to seek the parent, not just for survival, but for relationship. Okay? Remember, it's very different than Freud. Fairbairn was suggesting that object seeking in its most radical form is not the vehicle for satisfaction of a need, but the expression of our nature, the form through which we become human beings. And here I have a, a chart that shows the difference between Freud and Fairbairn. Freud said 
Libido seeks pleasure. Fairbairn said, libido is looking for relationship. It's object seeking. And remember, he had his Christian faith in the background. That's why he said that. Freud said the object is the means by which tension is reduced and pleasure realized. No, Fairbairn said, no, 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 it's not the means. It's what it wants. It's the end. It's what it's going for. Okay. Freud said pleasure is the reason for seeking the object. Fairbairn said pleasure is the sign toward the object that we look for. Oh, I'm getting closer to the object, the relationship. Freud drives precede the development of ego structure, that there's these energies and all. No, Fairbairn said no. We are born with a structure from the very beginning. We're born with this desire within us. It's, it's God's law, God's desire is within us. Freud had a Helmholtzian view of science, that energy and structure are separate. Fairbairn had a 20th century view of science, that energy and structure are inseparable. So, and a more holistic um, view. Human beings are whole. So um, in terms then of how we're created, his ideas were based on Christian ideals, not on merely a modernistic scientific idea. Now fall, how did the, how did the Christian view of the fall impact Fairbairn's theory of development? The religious theme, decline and fracture in Calvinism. For Calvin, a pristine human origin, that means a whole human, marked by harmony, relationship to God, fellow humans, and Eden, connection with nature, breaks down through human will and falls and fractures. The fall was a cataclysmic event, but that fall also provided a new fractured structure of a world without harmony and community between people, within the self, and with nature. So it's all fractured. Fracture is what Fairbairn points to in the development of the human psyche. Now let's go to Fairbairn's theory. Now this is the part that's dense. The circle here is the ego as the child is born. The child is born whole and he relates or she relates to the good mother, taking the image of the good mother, the ideal object, into its mind under perfect conditions. Okay? And Fairbairn said he never met a person born in perfect conditions. So, um, so then what happens? The infant also relates to the bad side of mother that excites him. Oh, I'm coming in a minute, I'm coming, I'm coming. And mommy keeps him waiting and waiting and he gets excited and he gets let down. Or the rejecting mother that um, mom says, stop bothering me, okay? So he has the ideal object, but he has two other parts of mother, the one that promises and doesn't deliver and the other one that pushes him away. So we call it the exciting object and the rejecting object. These are all parts of mother. Now remember, this is part of what Melanie Klein had already talked about, but he develops it further. So parts of the central ego, that whole part, attaches to the exciting object, and that part that of mom that is the rejecting attaches to the part of the ego, and we call these parts the libidinal ego, and the anti-libidinal ego. So what was whole and full and rich now is fractured. And we lose a part of ourselves in these projections and interjections with the good and the bad parts of the mother. Okay? So we become limited in the area of ourselves in which we have freedom. We come in bondage to these bad parts of mother that have entered into us. So this is, this is the uh, schematic. A diminished central ego that still has good memories of the ideal object. The 
libidinal ego, which is the part that still wants love, but feels frustration because of the excitement that we get, like, oh, I, I'm going to have the most wonderful experience, and then you, you're let down. And then the other part that says, no, I stay away from relationship because people will fail you and I don't want to go there. So what happens is, notice on the, on the left there it says hostile repression, that you work with patients who um, maybe don't want to get close to people and then some person, they start to like them and they get close to them and, and then that person fails them. The anti-libidinal ego comes and says, I told you so, don't you ever get close to anybody again because you're going to get hurt. And pushes away the side that wants love because it reminds them of you're going to get hurt. And we all deal with patients like that. So you actually see Fairbairn's ideas in, in the office. Okay? Now, what do we do with this? Let's look at how Calvin and Fairbairn both dealt with this. The religious themes in Cal Calvin and Fairbairn. Fairbairn goes on to give psychological definition to what Calvin called bondage to sin. Through his formulation of the concept of cathexis being tied to bad objects, he interprets the compulsion to repeat as a derivative of the need to remain connected to parental objects. Humans, he felt, need to persist in their maladaptive behaviors because repetition maintains a connection. In other words, a person will stay with a rejecting partner because that rejecting partner is a connection to mom or dad, and they don't want to give up mom or dad. It, it's not an issue when somebody doesn't want to change or has difficulty changing. It's not because their will isn't strong enough. It's because they want relationship. They're born for relationship. And unconsciously, they stay connected to the aspects of that parent um, that they hold on to unconsciously that are dissociated and split off. Okay? Are you following me? Okay. That's why I have great difficulty with some biblical counselors who will give Bible verses to people and say, now if you trust the Lord and you pray, you'll be able to overcome this. Okay? And they don't realize that the person is persisting in certain behaviors because inside it keeps them connected with mommy or with daddy. Okay? For instance, I have a patient who is schizophrenic and early on in her life, Every bit of her sickness was um, responded to lovingly by mother. Mother, who was also a sick person. So mother had a sick identity, daughter had a sick identity, and she persists in holding on to mother through keeping her sick identity and through not thinking of herself other than schizophrenic. You're more than your schizophrenia. You have lots to you that's more than your schizophrenia. And so to have her be able to let go of the connection to mom and build a, a different connection, a different identity. So this is what Fairbairn is talking about, the attachment to the bad. Psychopathology is more than an absence or avoidance of good relations. We observe not just an avoidance of the positive, but a fascination with the negative. Okay. The dilemma we hear in the book of Romans. I have the desire to do what's good, but I can't carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, this I keep doing. Okay. Okay. So Fairbairn and Calvin talked about we are tied to things that we don't want to be tied to. He conceptualized the terminology, uh, the sins of the parents are passed on to the children. In the book of uh, Exodus, the sins of the parents are visited to the children, to the third and fourth generation. How we understand it, it's because the children want to keep the connection. Okay. This results in alienation. 
um, because people begin to live out of these projections. They're not relating to you as you, they're relating to you out of this internal world that is seeing the rejection, that is seeing the exciting object. Oh, you don't really care for me. You're, re you're lying to me. You know, you're going to use me. You're going to make me think you care, and then you're going to leave and move away. Okay? These are living out of all of these projections. Okay? Redemption and Fairbairn's theory of therapeutic change. The religious theme. Fairbairn used the metaphor of longing for Edom to depict life as it was meant to be. He stressed the importance of the real and personal therapeutic relationship for healing and redeeming the fractured psyche. In the new and real relationship with the therapist, the parts of the ego that are split off and connected to bad objects can be brought back into the central ego. Fairbairn characterized the function of the analyst as messiah, savior, exorcist, and evangel evangelist. Those were terms he and patients used to conceptualize the analyst's role. As in the Calvinist narrative, only the love of the other, the therapist, can reach the patient who's locked inside this internal world and can offer the hope of freedom and relationship. Interpretation or doctrine alone will not accomplish this. The agent for change is personal relationship offered by a caring other. Now, somebody said this way before Fairbairn did. The new object in Calvin. More than a century before Fairbairn penned these ideas, the founder of the Free Church, Thomas Chalmers, and the brother of the man that founded the school he went to, delivered a sermon that was well known and it's called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. You can go Google it and this message will come up. This was one of the leaders of the school that he went to. So what did Chalmers write? And, and he wrote it, um, the word, I've changed the wor word world and I put bad object so that you can see what Fairbairn did. The love of the bad object cannot be expunged, gotten rid of, by a mere demonstration of the bad object's worthlessness. You can't say to a person, your mother was a bad mother, stop being so connected to her. But may it not be supplanted by the love of that which is more worthy than itself? The heart cannot be prevailed upon to part with the bad object by a simple act of resignation. I surrender to you, God. But may not the heart be prevailed upon to admit into its preference another who shall subordinate the bad object and bring it down from its wanted ascendancy? If the throne which is placed there must have an occupier, if our heart needs to be connected to somebody, and the tyrant, the bad object that is now in there has occupied it uh, wrongfully, he may not leave a bosom that would rather have a tyrant than have nothing at all. In a word, if the way to disengage the patient from the love of one great and bad object is to fasten it to positive love to another, then it's not by just exposing the truth of how bad the former is, but by addressing the mental eye to the worth and excellence of the latter, that all old things are to be done away and all things are to become new. So what he's saying, what, what this pastor was saying in scriptural terms is, don't tell somebody to get rid of the devil and sin in your life. Show them the love of Christ and who you are. And that love will draw them. And then that love of the sin that is in there will not have a hold on them. And that's the same thing with the therapist. That it is when they see your reliability, your care, your love, and your, your wisdom and your interpre interpretation is important because people are confused. They begin to realize there's something other than what I've been holding on to, and they allow you into their world, okay? And they allow love into their world, and they recapture those parts that have been imprisoned. Okay. The new good object in Fairbairn. The real decisive factor in psychotherapy is the relationship between patient and analyst. The chief aim of psychoanalytic treatment is to promote a maximum synthesis of the structures 
of which, into which the original ego has been split in the setting of a therapeutic relationship with the analyst. Interpretation of the transference is not enough. Relationship with the analyst must develop and disrupt the closed internal system. So the goal, both in spirituality and in therapeutic work, is all of us under the Lordship of Christ. All parts brought back into whole, wholeness. And isn't that what holiness is? Sanctification? It is wholeness. So, and I close this portion with this image of Fairbairn's headstone. When we were studying over there and researching, I so desperately wanted to visit where he was buried, and nobody had it writ anywhere written where he was buried. Could not find it. So it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We went to the church that he had his memorial service at, and I said, well, maybe he was buried in the cemetery close to here. So we went, we took the taxi, and it's quarter to 5. The cemetery closes at 5. And I said, well, I, drop us off. We'll go. Hundreds, if not thousands, of gravestones. I thought, well, I'll knock at the door of the caretaker who knows where everybody is here. No caretaker. So Lowell and I looked at each other, and we said, okay, you go there, I go here. Let's start walking. No more than 20 feet, I yelled, Lowell! <laughs> and there it was, right in front of us. And that's his grave with his first and his uh, second wife. He died. And um, what an honor to know that God used this man in psychoanalysis and wove back in um, so much theology back into psychoanalysis. So here you have it. Okay, and I think we're, we're at the end of our segment.